th with that, I'd like to introduce our guest, um, uh, Arif uh, Hussein, who's the chief economist of the uh, World Food Program, and Rain Paulson, who's been a frequent guest here uh, from the FAO, who's the director of emergencies. Are you gentlemen on? We yes, we are. We see you. Great. Uh, so I think uh, Arif will let you go first, and um, then we'll, we'll move on. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Uh, hello, everybody. So, so I'm just going to very quickly present the, the results of what is called the Global Report on the Food Crisis. Uh, it is a report which is essentially produced by about 17 different partners, you know, from the UN, from development agencies, from humanitarian agencies, from regional bodies. Uh, and, and, uh, and they look at the, the, the situation, the, the, the hunger situation of the world, but from the acute food insecurity side. Uh, this report is done by what is called the Food Security Information Network uh, for the, uh, the a big body, which is the, the global ne network against food crises. Um, one thing to note about this report is that this doesn't cover the entire world, but it focuses on 53 countries uh, in 2021, and then it also provides a forecast for about 41 countries going forward. So this is not the whole picture, but it is a subset of, of a picture on which there is big consensus. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of the numbers in 2021, in these 53 countries, there were more than 193 million people who were in crisis or worse level of food insecurity. Over half a million people in four countries were in catastrophe or famine. About 39 million people were in emergency in 36 countries, meaning a step away from famine. And then an additional 133 million people in 36 countries were in crisis level of food insecurity. Now, this obviously, you know, from year to year, the numbers of countries which we cover kind of go up. Uh, but we have been doing this for the last six years. So when we look at the trend, what we find is that hunger since 2016 has been consistently going up, acute hunger, crisis level hunger, meaning that in 2016, we had about 94 million people who were in crisis or worse hunger conditions. In 2021, there was, that number was 180 million people. That is a 92% increase in, in just six years. Now, other thing which is, which is, which is uh, important to, to, to note is that these 570,000 people who are in famine were in four countries in 2021, meaning in Ethiopia, in South Sudan, in Yemen, and in Madagascar. Of these four countries, Three were purely conflict, meaning Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Yemen. And Madagascar famine in 2021 was related to climate, climatic shocks. But by the way, we've never had 570,000 people in catastrophe in any of the six years that this report has been uh, produced. Another interesting fact is that in six countries, there are at least 12 million people who are in crisis or worse food security situation. This is like the top one, Democratic Republic of Congo, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Yemen, Northeast Nigeria, and Syria. Now coming very quickly to what are the root causes? What is the, what is the reason why? And the biggest by far reason is man-made conflict. Of these 193 million people in countries, 72% meaning are, are, uh, are in this situation because of conflict. Another 30 million people in 21 countries are suffering because of economic shocks, mostly driven by COVID and its consequences as well. And then another 23.5 million people in eight countries are suffering because of climatic shock. So these three reasons, 
if I can say it again, conflict, climate, and COVID-related economic consequences are some of the biggest reasons why we are seeing such levels of food insecurity and hunger in the world. A couple other things. Uh, there are about 51 million internally displaced people globally, okay? Of which 45 million, almost all, are in 24 countries which are affected by food crises. So there is a really strong correlation between conflict, displacement, and food insecurity. And, and the top six over there, again, Syria, Afghanistan, DRC, Yemen, Ethiopia, and Sudan. Then we also looked at the children. And what we find is that in these 50, Three countries, there are about 26 million children who are severely wasted, who are wasted and severely wasted. By the way, 11 million of those, 11.5 million of those are only in four countries. So, and those countries again are Ethiopia, Afghanistan, Sudan, and Yemen. So you can see the trend that a lot of food insecurity, a lot of conflict, a lot of displacement, a lot of Child malnutrition, it is concentrated in few countries, but with very, very big numbers. Now, I mentioned that, you know, this report also looks at, uh, at, at the forecast, meaning for year 2022. And that's really scary because just in 41 countries around the world, 181 million people are forecasted to be in crisis or worse situations in 2022. And by the way, this doesn't account for Ukraine or what its, its consequences beyond the borders of Ukraine. Now, very quickly as World Food Program, as you may know, we are present in about 80 plus countries. So we keep an eye on all those 80, 81 countries and our figures, even before Ukraine for those 81 countries were already 276 million people. This had risen from about 150 million post uh, uh, pre-COVID. And we have also analyzed, you know, what would be the impact of Ukraine crisis on global food insecurity. And what we see is that we expect another 47 million people to become Try, you know, be, become acutely food insecure, meaning in crisis or worse situation. So altogether, that puts us to about 323 million people around the around the world. Now, what we are we are what we are saying is that as as as, as World Food Program, that we need to assist these people. Uh, now we are planning to, to reach as many as 145 million people this year. For that, we continue to need financing, but also in many parts, sustained humanitarian access. I will stop here. Thank you. Now we turn the floor over to Mr. Paulson. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity. And as you've heard, um, Arif has uh, laid out all of the numbers in this uh, sixth edition of the of the global report. So let me maybe just build on that by focusing on a, a small number of uh, concerns. Um, the first of which uh, relates to um, the increase in uh, acute food uh, security, as we've documented it, and this steady progression that Arif was mentioning since 2016. Um, one other key indicator to complement what Arif just shared. Uh, if over those six years you look at the percentage of the population analyzed who are in acute food insecurity, that has also gone up from just over 11% in 2016 uh, to just over 22% uh, uh, in 2021. So, I mean, there's a lot of numbers here, but the message that comes quite clearly through all of this is food security, acute food insecurity has been getting progressively worse over those years. Obviously, that's the first of our concerns. But our second concern related to this as well then uh, relates to funding flows and financing. Arif was mentioning what the World Food Programme uh, requires. I'll, I'll say something about FAO in a second. In a macro sense, 
uh, at the same time as you have these six years of worsening acute food insecurity, what we see in 2020, the last year we've done this analysis, uh, is a five-year low in funding for uh, food crisis uh, context. And here I'm talking specifically about funding for um, uh, food security activities, funding for uh, the types of activities that uh, the WFP does, FAO does, importantly also funding for nutrition uh, work that uh, uh, entities are going into. So in 2021, there was 8.1 billion US dollars collectively available uh, for emergency work in these settings. That's 25% lower than in 2017. Obviously then, these trends of increases in acute food insecurity as documented through uh, the global uh, report and the numbers you've just heard, uh, matched with a declining global trend in funding is of huge uh, concern. Um, and the third piece I want to mention on this, and uh, Arif touched on it, but it is really important to underscore, this analysis and even these early projections for next year, when already we're seeing that in 41 uh, of the countries for which we have data as we're looking into 2021, there are already uh, an additional 5 million people uh, in acute food insecurity beyond the current projections. Uh, as we look at all of these numbers, that analysis is not yet factoring in uh, the consequences of uh, the war in Ukraine on global food security. So we're facing a, a significant challenge. Uh, our concern and our priority as FAO is, uh, quite frankly, that we need to um, we need to redouble investment in uh, famine prevention. We need to redouble uh, investment in. Uh, agriculture as part of uh, famine uh, prevention. You've heard the headline numbers uh, just to say that two-thirds of all of these uh, individuals who are experiencing acute food insecurity are located in rural areas. These are individuals who live and rely on agriculture for uh, their survival. One other quick statistic uh, at the risk of putting too many out there, but funding for agriculture in particular uh, when we did our analysis uh, over the last five years was just 5% of what went into overall uh, food security. So this is something that does need to be uh, addressed as part of the overall uh, response. Uh, the FAO is uh, urgently asking for 1.5 billion US dollars now, right now, uh, to support 50 million of the world's most food uh, insecure uh, people. We're on the ground, uh, we're delivering uh, in Ukraine, in elsewhere, uh, and that's uh, our priority and uh, and our uh, commitment. Maybe the last comment I'd make, and uh, then uh, happy to uh, see what questions may come in. Uh, as we held the release event today for the global report, there were a lot of, I think, really important reflections that come through also in the, in the analysis on the need for working across humanitarian uh, development and uh, peace uh, pillars. Um, if we're seeing this worsening trend year on year uh, and the decline in funding, it's also telling us that we have to work differently. We know how to do it, uh, but we do need support uh, and attention to drive forward programming in uh, the Nexus space if we're going to address root causes. And that's really probably the biggest rallying cry that comes out of this analysis. But let me maybe uh, stop there uh, and revert back to uh, the chair for any questions that colleagues may have. Over for questions. Uh, first question goes to Edie Letterer. Uh, thank you very much. On behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association, for doing this briefing, um, I have two questions. First, um, you said that the impact of the ongoing war in Ukraine has not yet been factored in. Uh, can you give us any indication of um, how of the impact you believe it will happen, particularly on um, countries that are already facing severe insecurity in food? Secondly, in terms of the financing issue, um, Obviously, uh, COVID was one issue in recent years, but um, in that decline from 2017 to 20, 
21. Um, what other issues do you see that were key to the loss of significant financing, and how are you going to recoup that, that um, money and reach um, the very significant funding that you need for this year? Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Paul, would you like to, uh, I can go first if you want. Uh, right? Go ahead, please, sir. Yeah. Um, so, so just on the on the, the the increased number because of the Ukraine crisis, uh, as World Food Program, we did the analysis, and we tried to to essentially look at how many more people would be affected. Uh, because of the war in Ukraine in terms of higher food prices, higher fuel prices, and also inflation uh, transmitting from global level to different countries. And our estimate for our projection is that it would be an additional uh, 47 million people who would be acutely food insecure because of this crisis now. Uh, there are also many other... Uh, Numbers which are which are out there, which are also essentially in the same 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 um, same um, let's say range. The, the the other thing I wanted to say was that it is not only that the numbers are increasing, but it is also impacting us as World Food Program because our costs are going up, our costs of assisting people are going up. To put that in perspective. Um, our cost from 2019, meaning before COVID, to today have gone up by $71 million more per month. This $71 million is enough to feed both with food and cash about 3.8 million people every month, per month. So it is a significant impact on people, but also on the ability of humanitarian agencies and other in agencies in order to help. On your second question, I would just say that, you know, this war is not happening in a vacuum. We were already dealing with the consequences of COVID in terms of people's reduced incomes, even food and fuel prices before the Ukraine war were already at a 10-year high for food and seven-year high for fuel. So, so what you're seeing this this crisis is essentially more fuel on a fire which was already burning and burning hot. In fact, it maybe add to what Arif has uh, shared that um, when when you look at the report, and I hope you do get a chance to look at the details, you'll see amongst other things that there's uh, there's a core set of 19 countries that have been uh, uh, consistently at the heart of this analysis over the six years. There's a larger group of countries, as Arif mentioned, but they constitute um, between 70 to 80 percent of uh, the total acutely food insecure population that's uh, analysed. The fact that those countries are there year on year, so our analysis spreads back six years, these crises go back even before then uh, in most cases. Um, you know, if you ask the question around, well, what's been happening in terms of funding trends, I do think it's, uh, it's important for us to take away the fact that in these protracted crises, we have to find a way to work differently in uh, the nexus, right? And I think also donors expect that, and that may be one of the reasons why there have been some challenges, but it's a very complex question around uh, why the funding has uh, gone down. But, you know, for us, what we're advocating strongly for as FAO is, you know, the, the right type of mix of programming. We need to go big when it comes to emergency food aid interventions to tie acute families over in a lean season. We need to go big when it comes to ensuring that farming families have the seeds and the inputs they need to plant uh, in a cropping season. We need a, a, a much more nuanced uh, approach. We have uh, the skill sets, capacities analysis. We do this in many uh, contexts, but we're reliant on not just amounts of money, but money being given at the right points in time for particular crisis 
context. And so that's another key message I'd, I'd share in response to your question. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, James? James Bays from Al Jazeera. Your report um, focuses on the very worrying situation, as you say, in some of these countries, 40 or so countries, and very severe situation in about five countries. What is your message, though, today to the biggest, richest countries? What do you say today to the G7, the G20? How urgent is this for them to do more? I think this is, this is an excellent question. I think this is uh, food insecurity around the world is exploding. Um, hunger is exploding. And if we don't address these issues, we end up paying, frankly, thousands times more just a few years down the road. We have seen this happen after Syria crisis in Europe. We have seen this happen with Afghanistan. We have seen this happen with Central America and the US. We have seen this happen with Haiti and the US. So we need to have two types of solutions. One is absolutely now making sure that people don't starve. And then we need to think a little bit longer term where it is about rethinking our agricultural policies. It is about rethinking our energy policies so that we are not in a space like this ever again. I will also go and say that it is not about being self-sufficient in food, but it is certainly about being diversified in your food and in your energy. And I think this is one of the big lessons learned of this crisis. We need to make sure, I mean, if you, if you saw your own, let's say, investment portfolio, you would not buy one single asset or you would not buy, you know, one single stock in a particular asset, you will diversify. Why is our food not diversified enough? Why is our stocks not diversified enough and held by only a few countries? So when there is a shock, you feel that across the world. I think these are the big lessons which we need to address going forward so we are not in the same position again. And this, frankly, is not new. We were here in 2008 after the food and fuel crisis. Some things then have happened, but they didn't happen. We were again there in 2011. Nothing happened. Maybe this is the third time, and hopefully we do something about it. But that would be the medium term. We need to deal with major short term, saving people's lives, and also then rethink our policies, like I said. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Edward? Oh, sorry, Mr. Paulson. Sorry, just just one quick statement. I, uh, if, if the question is what's the message to the G7 and others, I would simply say that uh, the example of what was possible in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, I think, is compelling. We need to put the same energy collectively that we put into addressing the COVID-19 pandemic into addressing acute hunger. That's simply stated. The amounts of resources that were mobilized and the way in which new mechanisms, new structures, new solutions were put in place tells us that we can do this. Yeah? It's about uh, political will and focus. So let's use that example uh, to address acute hunger. Thank you. Uh, Edward? Hi, this is Edward from China Central Television. Uh, this question is for, uh, for both for Mr. Hussein and uh, Mr. Posen. Uh, first, do, do, do you have any data of, of how much of the uh, normal agricultural activities are uh, has been interrupted uh, in the Ukraine by because of the conflict and what that could mean? And secondly, uh, how would how would the, the Ukraine conflict affect the export of the Russian agricultural products, and what what, what would be the effect for the world um, food supply? Thank you. Let me let me just take it one by one. Um, as you know, Russia and Ukraine they are in top five exporters of wheat, of corn, and of uh, sunflowers, oil seeds, basically. Uh, what we, so that's, that's the first part. 
The second part is that there is not much grain or 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 commodities coming out of Ukraine. There are commodities coming out of Russia, but they are coming up out at a much higher cost, meaning freight cost. So this is why what you're when you look at this problem from a consumer side, it costs a lot more now because of this crisis than it cost before this crisis. So now put yourself in the position where in a low income country or low, lower middle income country where you were, let's say, spending 50% of your income or more on food. And suddenly your, got, your, your food got more expensive. This is what we are seeing in many parts of the, of, of the world as we speak. One other thing which is really important, we talk about food, high food prices affects people. We talk about high fuel prices which affects everybody, but don't forget high fertilizer prices. And why is fertilizer so important? Because it has consequences for the next agricultural season. So right now it's not a production problem, it is a access affordability problem but if there is not enough fertilizer, if there is not enough other agricultural inputs, come next season, it would be availability and affordability problem. Maybe just in the interest of time, let me say, um, uh, if you go to the FAO website, there's a dedicated page uh, on um, uh, the war in Ukraine and implications, and there's updated analysis there on uh, the food security situation in the country, um, uh, as well as analysis on global implications uh, too. So I just refer you to uh, to that analysis, please. Thank you very much, uh, Arul. It's Arul Lewis from IANS. Uh, you said that the Ukrainian crisis has uh, exacerbated the food crisis. Or the, food, the global food security situation overall. Uh, India has a huge surplus of uh, wheat, uh, amounting to tens of uh, millions of tons. Uh, are any of your organizations doing anything to uh, utilize more of the stockpile? And a second question related to that is the, the World Trade Organization has uh, put restrictions on how much India can uh, export. Would you uh, think that those rules should be suspended in the current emergency. Thanks. Okay, so so all I can tell you is that we are uh, we are we are in in uh, in discussions with India on on on, uh, on procurement of wheat. Uh, so so that is something which is which is ongoing, and also that uh, one of the recommendations, whether it is uh, it is. Uh, uh, World Food Program, or IMF, or World Bank, or even World, also World Trade Organization, is about exemption of uh, World Food Program from uh, export bans. Uh, and this is something. There was a press release on this only a couple of weeks ago, uh, where where uh, these uh, these organizations they. They have. They are encouraging governments not to put export bans, not to put things like that, which then artificially increase the the the, the price and availability, or or reduce the availability of major staple commodities. So this is something which is a very big recommendation, and uh, and hopefully uh, countries are listening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't know all right. Uh, so, sorry, were you were you making a response? No, sorry. I, no, uh, to say I don't have anything in particular to add on this, okay. but but the analysis around the availability of commodities in different countries is, uh, and I've factored into the analysis I referred to on the FA website, but it's an area that sits a little bit outside of my direct area of responsibility. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, last question, Ibtisam. Thank you, Farhan. Uh, thank you for the briefing. My name is Ibtisam uh, Azim from Al-Arabi Al-Jadid newspaper. I have two follow-ups. The first one about 
you said that the uh, communities that are coming out of Russia uh, are higher now. Uh, so my question is, uh, b what's the reason behind that? Is it, uh, does it have to do with the fact that the Russians raised the prices or the sanctions or both or uh, uh, what uh, exactly behind that? And then the second question about the issue of free thinking, the agriculture map. Um, and uh, so my question is, how long would it take from the process of free thinking to actually uh, in um, change, ha seeing and starting to uh, make some change uh, in this regard? Thank you. Uh, let me just just correct that. Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, what I said was that there are commodities which are coming out of Russia, uh, but the, the the freight costs are higher than they used to. Um, so, but from Ukraine side, there's not much coming out at all. That's what I was saying. Uh, I didn't. I'm sorry. I didn't get your second second question. Uh, yeah, no, sure. Um, so the, you talked about the fact that we need to um, rethink the way the uh, commodities and the agriculture goods are contributed and uh, where are they and how. Um, uh, and the, the question is, uh, and you talked about the fact that there was a, um, uh, problems in 2008 and then uh, about two years later and nothing has changed uh, or not much. And maybe now, for the third time, uh, there will be some changes. The question is, yeah. from that process until you start having changes, and who needs to make the change? Uh, governments or et cetera? Yeah, yeah I think th that's, yeah, have India, exactly that's what I said. And basically what I was saying is that, yes, it is the governments. Uh, how we, how, you know, um, we, we need to, to make sure that our, our, our our food supplies are sufficiently diversified. So when there is some kind of uh, um, bottleneck um, or some time of a crisis, uh, the, the consequences of that are not as devastating as we see right now. That's what I was saying. Thank you. Yeah, no, but my question is how long are you, it's going to take from uh, this thinking until uh, basically uh, starting to, f to see changes. I can hear you. There was too much uh, disruption. She asked, how long Sorry. will it take before we can start to see changes? Well, that's, a, that's, again, a very good question. I think this is not, you know, when you're dealing with agricultural uh, issues, it's not something which you can do in a month or a week or a it takes some time, but that's why it is important to to do what needs to happen in the near term, which is saving people's life, but also then in the medium term, help, you know, uh, implement some of these things where then your energy supplies and your food supplies are diversified. So it takes time. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but that doesn't mean that we should not do it. Over. Okay. I think there's a really important point here, which is that we, you know, we have the models. We know how to address these things, right? We know how to build social protection systems at scale. We know how to put early warning systems in place. We know how to strengthen resilience at a community level. But the amount of resources that go into that at the moment is minuscule compared to what's required. And so I think it's less about um, the, the models and much more around ensuring that those models are resourced in the right way to create the transformative change that's required. That's another sort of rallying cry that comes out, I think, of the, uh, the global report released today and some of the reflections around it. Excellent. Okay. Um, I don't see any, th any further questions, so uh, I would like to thank once again uh, our guests, uh, Arif Hussain and Rin Paulson. Uh, thanks very much for, for your uh, presentations. And uh, have a good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Thank you very much. Likewise. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks.